This video is about spontaneity and entropy. By the end of this video, you should understand the factors that make a process thermodynamically favorable. You should understand the term entropy. You should be able to determine whether a process represents an increase or a decrease in entropy. And you should be able to calculate entropy changes given standard values. In the study of thermodynamics, a spontaneous process is a process that proceeds without outside intervention. These processes can be fast or slow. Thermodynamics only tells us whether or not a process will happen. It doesn't tell us anything about the speed of that process. For that information, we need to look to kinetics. So thermodynamics just looks at whether something will spontaneously occur or not. A term that we'll be using often when looking at spontaneity is thermodynamically favored. Things that are thermodynamically favorable tend to be spontaneous. Also note that the reverse process of a spontaneous process must be non-spontaneous. Let's look at some examples. A ball rolling down a hill is a spontaneous process. The ball does not require any outside intervention to roll down the hill. Note that it might require an initial push to get it over the peak of the hill. This is akin to the activation energy in a reaction. However, once the ball starts rolling down the hill, no intervention is required. The opposite process, however, a ball rolling up a hill, is non-spontaneous. This will not happen without outside intervention. Likewise, iron combining with oxygen to form rust is a spontaneous process. However, rust does not spontaneously break down into iron and oxygen. Previously, we've seen that processes that minimize potential energy tend to be thermodynamically favorable. This basically means that exothermic processes tend to happen spontaneously, whereas endothermic processes need input of energy. Based on enthalpy alone, it seems that all exothermic processes should be spontaneous and all endothermic processes should be non-spontaneous since exothermic processes are thermodynamically favorable and endothermic processes are not. This is not the case, however. As one of many examples, considering the dissolving of ammonium nitrate. This is a spontaneous process. However, it's endothermic. This reaction absorbs energy. So how is this possible? So it turns out that most spontaneous processes are exothermic, but some are endothermic. This means that there must be something other than enthalpy determining whether or not a process is spontaneous or not. This factor is something called entropy. Spontaneity depends on both the enthalpy change of a system and the entropy change of a system. Entropy, which is abbreviated with a capital S, is a measure of the number of possible arrangements of a system. Consider a simple system, like a hundred piece puzzle. There are many, 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 many ways for that 100 piece puzzle to be disordered, but really only a few ways for it to be ordered. If you want to get really picky, there's really only one way for a 100 piece puzzle to be perfectly ordered. Entropy is often thought about as the degree of randomness or chaos, though I think it's more useful to consider it as the number of possible arrangements since that's a little bit more meaningful and quantifiable than just the term chaos. You may have noticed from your own life that the universe sort of tends towards entropy. Your room kind of just tends towards increasing disorder. A puzzle sort of tends towards increasing disorder, unless of course you're putting in energy to make it ordered. This is because, as we said before, there's a lot of ways to be disordered, but only a few ways to be ordered. Entropy change, we find, is a state function, which means it only depends on the initial and final conditions. Therefore, we can calculate entropy change by subtracting the entropy of the reactants from the entropy of the products. It's not possible to measure delta S or entropy change directly. There's no entropyometer. However, we can predict from a balanced equation whether or not entropy is increasing or decreasing. When the products have more entropy than the reactants, our entropy change is positive because entropy has increased. When our products have less entropy than our reactants, our entropy is decreased, meaning our delta S is negative. Much like negative enthalpy changes are thermodynamically favorable, positive entropy changes are thermodynamically favorable, meaning processes that increase entropy tend to be more favored. Consider a simple example where we see entropy increasing. 
as the substance goes from solid to liquid to gas, we see an increase in entropy. The solid has very orderly particles. With the liquid, the particles are able to move about a bit more, making them slightly less ordered. In a gas, however, the particles are able to fly about all over the place, making them very disordered. Consider the fact that there are tons and tons of arrangements for the particles in a gas, while there are fewer for the liquid, and even fewer for the solid. Let's consider some general rules for when we see entropy increasing. We just looked at phase changes. When we go from solid to liquid to gas, entropy will increase. Likewise, when solutions are formed from liquids and solids, the dissolving of an ionic compound results in more particles since we have dissociation. If there are more particles in a system, there is definitely more possible arrangements for those particles. When we create more moles of product than we had reactant, this is another case where entropy increases. Notice in each of these cases, we went from fewer moles of reactant to more moles of product. Here, two moles to four moles, and here, one mole to two moles. Again, more particles gives you more possible arrangements. When we increase the temperature of a substance, entropy tends to increase. Since particles are moving around more, they can have more possible arrangements. And finally, when the volume of a gas is increased. Again, when there's more places for the particles to be, there's more possible ways for them to be arranged. One of the easiest ways to predict the sign of delta S in a chemical reaction is to count the number of moles of gas of reactant and product. Take this example. Here we have no moles of gas in the reactants and one mole of gas in the products. Therefore, we have increased entropy. In this example, we have three moles of gaseous reactant and two moles of gaseous product. Therefore, we have decreased entropy. Consider the four processes shown here. Pause the video and try to answer the question above. When you come back, I'll reveal the answer. If you said A, you were correct. Here, we're going from a solid to a gas, which is a relatively large increase in entropy. In B, we have two moles of gaseous reactant and two moles of gaseous product. Therefore, we have no change in entropy. In C, solid to liquid, we have an increase in entropy, but not as much as solid to gas. And finally, in D, aqueous to solid, we're actually decreasing entropy. So let's look at some specific reactions and consider their enthalpy changes and their entropy changes, and whether or not they're spontaneous. The first reaction we're going to look at is an explosion, as shown on the bottom left. As I'm sure you can predict, this is an exothermic reaction, giving us a negative sign on our delta H or delta E. Likewise, entropy increases in an explosion. Therefore, delta S is positive. Here we see two thermodynamically favorable factors, an increase in entropy and a decrease in enthalpy. Therefore, this process will always be spontaneous under any conditions, since both factors are thermodynamically favorable. Consider now the case of a melting ice cube. The melting of an ice cube is an endothermic process, and since we're going from solid to liquid, entropy is increasing. Therefore, we have both a positive delta S and a positive delta H. Our positive delta S is thermodynamically favorable. However, our positive delta H is thermodynamically unfavorable. Therefore, this reaction will be spontaneous at some times and not at other times. Consider to yourself when the melting of ice is spontaneous and when it isn't. We'll come back to this in the next slide. Next, we see the reaction between sodium and chlorine to form sodium chloride. This reaction is exothermic, as you can see by the flame here. However, since we're forming a solid from a gas in a solid, entropy is decreasing, giving us a negative delta S and a negative delta H. Again, we see one thermodynamically favorable factor and one thermodynamically unfavorable factor. Again, we see that this reaction will be spontaneous under some conditions and not under others. Finally, looking at the process of photosynthesis as shown here, we see that this process is endothermic because it requires sunlight and it involves a decrease in entropy since we have 12 moles of gas in the reactants and 6 moles of gas and 1 mole of solid in the products. This gives us a negative delta S and a positive delta H. These are both thermodynamically unfavorable factors, meaning this reaction will never occur spontaneously. It will always require outside intervention.
So, as we see, when both factors are thermodynamically favored, our reaction will always be spontaneous. When both factors are thermodynamically unfavorable, our reaction will never be spontaneous. So what's the other thing we need to know in cases 2 and 3? Consider again the melting of ice. It turns out that spontaneity and thermodynamic favorability are also temperature dependent in some cases. For instance, the melting of ice is spontaneous at temperatures above 0 degrees, but it's non-spontaneous at temperatures below 0 degrees. As we mentioned before, it's not possible to measure entropy changes. However, since delta S is a state function, we can calculate delta S from the initial and the final entropy states. The third law of thermodynamics essentially sets an entropy standard. It says that the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero. Of course, this is an idealized state since we can't have something at zero Kelvin, but the entropy scale basically works on this assumption. Based on this law, we can calculate the delta S for a substance at various temperatures. Just as we saw with delta H, we can calculate delta S by subtracting the total entropy of reactants from the total entropy of products. These entropy values are published in tables and will always be given to you. Here's an example to try on your own. Pause the video here, and when you come back, I'll reveal the answer. Welcome back. Here's what you should have gotten. Notice here our negative delta S indicates a decrease in entropy. This could have been predicted from the balanced equation, which tells us we had three moles of gaseous reactant, but only two moles of gaseous product. Therefore, we have a decrease in entropy. That brings us to the end of this video. Let's review our goals. First, we looked at the factors that make a process thermodynamically favorable. These are a negative enthalpy change and a positive entropy change. Then we looked at the term entropy. Then we learned how to determine whether a process represents an increase or a decrease in entropy. And finally, we learned to calculate entropy changes given standard values.